We're just going to worship God. Lalu, you are the reason. I just want us to be in an attitude of worship. We've heard so much already this morning. I don't think anything else needs to be added. But he is the reason why we are here today. You are the reason why I lift my hands. Why I lift my voice. Why I sing to you. You are the reason I'm alive today. I am here to say it's all because of you. You are the reason. You are the reason. You are the reason. You are the reason. You are, you are. You are the reason. You are the reason. You are the reason. You are the reason. You are my strength, strength like no other, strength like no other, reaches to me. You are my strength, strength like no other. Like no other reaches to me. You are my strength. You are my strength. Strength like no other. Strength like no other reaches to me. Brethren, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for the family of Ava White, a 12-year-old that was stabbed in Liverpool. And she just went for the Christmas light switching, you know, the lights that they switched on in the city center. And from there, she had an argument. Now, I want to say something about, you know, even recently, you know, there was something that my husband was sharing. And I said to my husband, I said, you never know the people that are arguing with you. You don't know whether they have something. So there's no point. And so a 12-year-old just had an argument with a group of four boys. The youngest is 13 years old. And yet they stabbed her in the city center. We're going to pray for that family because when she left home that day, they had no idea or knowledge that their daughter would not come back home. How many of us here have teenagers, youth, young adults? They go out and as they're going out, we're busy praying for their safe return. Brethren, we need to stand in the gap for this nation. That it is not by knifing our young ones, our youth and our teenagers that this nation will be destroyed. So I don't know how you want to pray, but if you're a mother and you are a father or you're just a human being that is concerned about the state of this nation, I just want us to lift up our voice that, Father, let your mercy prevail in this nation. Lord, we are standing in the gap for this nation. Lord, we lift up the family of Ava White into your hand, oh God. Lord, you know your daughter, you know her family, oh God. Lord, let them come to know you, oh God. Lord, through this incident, let them come to know about your love, oh God. Lord, we even lift up those who did this, in my, in mighty God. That, Lord, your mercy will prevail in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray, oh God, we are standing in the gap, oh God. You said that if my people who are called by my name will humble them 
themselves and turn from their wicked ways that you will heal the nation oh god lord heal the nation oh god lord heal the nation oh god lord heal the nation oh god it is enough is enough of the knifing in the uk enough is enough of the stabbings in the uk lord we don't want our youth and our young adults to be dying on the streets of the united kingdom oh god lord we saturate this nation in the mighty blood of jesus oh god have mercy, O God. Have mercy, O God. Let your mercy prevail, O God. Let your mercy prevail, O God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Let us continue in the attitude of prayer. Amen. And the Lord will answer our prayers in the mighty name of Jesus. Please be seated in the presence of the Lord. Now, as I said, most of the work has already been done. It started off from the workers' meeting, amen, when our darling sister, Sister Titi, shared on the thanksgiving of tithe and offering. If you want to have the notes, I wrote down my notes. If you want to reach out to Sister Titi, please feel free because it was very powerful and the Lord will bless you in the name of Jesus. So for those who, amen, please, if you're going to celebrate what God is doing in our midst, please celebrate. For those who are not around, amen, the message applies to everybody. It's not just for workers. It's so that you can, you know, um, you can tap into what God is doing in, in, in our, you see, one thing is true, amen. I can promise you something, but I can just promise you, amen. There's no guarantee that when I promise you, I will do it. Do you understand where I'm coming from? I might desire to do it, but situations and circumstances can change. And so what I intended to do, circumstances and situations have changed it. But God, when he promises, so there's nothing like circumstance and situation. He says, try me now and this and see if. So in other words, like, dare me. As a matter of fact, don't just dare me. Try and imagine the biggest thing that you can ever think of and see whether I will do what I said I would do. Amen. And as we said recently, it's like, how many of us pay car insurance? Even, whether, even though it's reluctantly. Amen. We don't really like paying insurance. How many of us pay insurance? Oh, no one pays insurance. <laughs> I was just checking, you know. You pay insurance. You're not sure whether you're going to use it. Yet, every year, you have to pay it. If you can't pay, if you're not paying it, your car is not on the road. If they should find you on the road with no insurance, God help you. And so when we have been talking since morning, it is also insurance. But this one, it is a, the insurer knows what is coming down the line before it happens. And there's a guarantee that when the time for payout comes, you don't even need to make a claim. Before you even say, Lord Jesus, there is already sorted. There is no insurance company on the face of this earth that they are willing to give you the money they owe you. How many, how many people have, have gone through insurance claims? You first of all call. Then they will send the assessor. I think Auntie Tyo was telling of her own story when her car had an accident. And they said, your car is a write-off. Oh, yeah, give me money for a car. Of course, by the time she they're going to give her money, it's not enough to buy another car. So she just went to take her car back. Am I not lying? Am I lying? Ah. When it, the money you have given me is not enough to buy a car. So let me just go. The one you have said is the right of, at least it's moving. Eh, I will take it back. But this insurance, even before you say Jesus sorted, it's not affected by inflation. It's not affected by you pay too much. There's nothing like too much on this insurance. It's assuring you that, that you know, he, he said it in Malachi. So I'm not going to, that's not the preaching of today. So I've made up my mind that that is not the preaching for today. But for those who are wanting to return their tithe today, amen. Can we, can we rise if you're online? Praise the Lord. So that we can pray for you. It just dawned on me that I don't even remember whether we returned tight last week. Amen. God have mercy. Amen. Let us pray. 
Father Lord, you are God of yea and amen. Your promises are true and they're forever. Lord, we thank you, O oh Lord, for your children that are returning what belongs to you. And I pray, O oh God, that Lord, the promises that are in your word will manifest in their lives in the name of Jesus. Things will never be tight for them. Your favor, as people have testified, your favor and open doors will continually open unto them, O oh God, with no stress in the mighty name of Jesus. And for those who have a desire to start, Almighty God, give them the grace, the enablement, and let them see that just as you said in your word, try me now and in this and see. Lord, let them come back and testify of your goodness and your mercy. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Praise the Lord. So I am mindful of time. Praise the Lord. Um, as we start looking at the word that God has laid in my heart to share with you, brethren, all of us. You know, I'm learning. Amen. We are all learning. Praise the Lord. So I want us all to prepare our hearts, prepare our minds for what God has installed in store for us today. Praise the Lord. Um, over the last few months, I've been, you know, studying the Word of God constantly. And recently, I was listening to a message, and it, I, it, I realized that I needed to make Jesus Lord in my life. Yes, I am born again, just in case you're wondering. I am born again. But one of the things I've learned in this race is you never finish learning. God is always opening us, our lives up to see what still needs to be attended to. I needed to examine myself and I allowed the Holy Spirit to show me where I needed him as Lord. I thought I was going to be ministering on something else entirely different and I thought I even had the confirmation I needed, but God had a plan. Amen. There is a son, there is a daughter, there is someone here today that needs to hear this word and my prayer is that God will move in our hearts to hear what the Lord is saying today. So the title, if you're going to give it a title, is Who is Lord? Who is Lord? Now, I know most of us know the meaning of the term landlord. So what does that mean? What does the term landlord mean? Thank you. <laughs> I'm not repeating that. <laughs> the owner of the land. Landlord. So there's a building that sits on the land. And when you, you know, because there's some people that buy property, but they don't own, they don't own the, the land. You, hey, that's, that's the one I was looking for, freehold. But landlord means the house that is on it, plus the land that is underneath it, and the roof that is on the house, plus the contents belongs to the landlord. Okay, I'm glad we said that. So, and I know that most of us desire to be landlords, praise the Lord. I can't really see you clearly, is it okay if I, ah, I beg, God help us. Amen. Now I can see, I can see clearly now. Now, Strong's con con concordance defines Lord as a supreme person in authority controller by implication and as brother noah has said owner so when i now heard i when i said i need to make jesus lord over my life i examined my life because suddenly i realized it's not in every aspect of my life that jesus was lord as in owner let's just take health for example if he's the owner of my health, would I just be eating anyhow? Sleeping anyhow? Oh, answer me now. Because if you say, mm, that ice cream, I know that it's cookie dough. But you're not moving around like the way you moved around in your 20s. So if you're going to take some cookie dough, make sure that you walk for at least another 30 minutes to burn it off. Or that gizdodo that you're planning to have. You know, owner. <laughs> if he's the owner of your life, I'll talk to 
you know, the young adults as well. Your body is not your own. You can't just be with anyone. You, you understand? You, you have a car. You, you ha you, and your, your teenage or your young adults, they can't just take your car anywhere because you're the primary insurer. I mean, ins the person insured on the, on, on the car. So if anything happens, who will be responsible? You as the primary person. So if Jesus is really Lord over my money, over my body, over my health, my career, then that means my life is not really my own. Do, are you with me? I can't just do things anyhow because I think I have, li I have liberty, but there's an owner. There's someone watching me. There's someone who knows my body better than, ah, if you should eat this cookie dough, when you go on the scales on Saturday, you're not going to like what you see, oh. And then I'll now do the, you know, the normal reaction when we're trying to be mindful. Uh, I'm not eating rice. I'm not eating bread. I'm not eating this. I'm not eating that. And you know that that only lasts for so long. You can only go for so long without eating that. Amen. Praise the Lord. So who is Lord in your life? Praise the Lord. I know that the answer for some of us might be no one is the Lord or Jesus is Lord or God is Lord. However, we're going to look at a few instances, and I want us to turn to Hosea 1 from verse 1 to 11. Hosea 1 from verse 1 to 11. This is a very tough story. I've read this story so many times. I've even had a fiction novel. Can you imagine a minister of God known in your country? And God says to your minister, I want you to marry a prostitute. I mean, first reaction is like, eh, what did you just say? Ah, Satan, I bind you. But Hosea heard clearly, and God had a reason and an intention. God said to a minister of God, I want you to go and marry Someone that is well, not even by the roadside, very well known as a prostitute. And you read that in Hosea 1. Let us turn to Hosea 1. Praise the Lord. Stay with me, oh. Hosea 1. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Biri, in the days of Uzzah, Jotham, Azan, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Verse 2. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of wardens and children of wardens. For the land hath committed great wardom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Goma, the daughter of Diblam, which conceived and bare him a son. So, Brethren, he is Lord, and he tells you to do something that it can only be God. First thing is, why would a holy God give such an instruction? Why would God, who is holy, who is mighty, who, you know, that cannot behold, you know, filth, he cannot behold sin, say to his minister, go and do this. Please, this is not a license for everyone to just go and do what, what has just been said. This one, God said. Amen. This, because if you enter it and you said that, they said on Sunday that God said, you are on your own. No. You are on your own. Yeah. Because not everyone has the grace that Hosea had. That you, she would have one child. She would go back to do prostitute. Come back home. Have another child. She would go back. Not everyone has that grace, so, so please, I am repeating myself. This is, a, this is a label that I am telling you. If God is not saying it, don't go and do it all. Don't come and say, I heard in church on Sunday, they gave me license. I did not say so. Aha. Uh -huh. But in all honesty, we're looking at the month of remembrance. We're laughing. 
It's true. But why would a holy God say to someone that is his minister, his representative, go to so and marry someone that is a prostitute? Love. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave. He came down from heaven where the streets are paved of gold, where there is no sin, holiness. Why did he come down? He came down to a nation, a, con a world that was rejected him, did not even care about him. Why? Love. He had to leave his position to come back to redeem his children. He couldn't have done it in heaven. He had to come down to become like us. And why was God saying to Hosea, go down and marry someone who's a prostitute? It's because of love. I want us to turn to Psalm 40 verse 2. Psalm 40 verse 2. And God reminded me about this about a week ago. God said, he said, Abby, remember, you too, you came out from a horrible pit. You too, you were in mud, in filth. Hosea, I mean, Psalm 40 verse 2. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the Mary Kay. And he set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Brethren, all of us were in filth before God delivered us. Okay, maybe not all of you because the way you're looking at me is as if. Okay, I was in filth rolling in the mud in sin and unrighteousness before Jesus came to save me. Amen. I don't know about the rest of you because the way you're looking at me is that, no, me, I was born holy. Oh. Uh, it's true. You know, because the truth of the matter is that, and that's one of the things that Pastor Timmy was saying, if you remember where God brought you from. I remember the suitcase I brought to the United Kingdom all. Oh. If I was to, the way I came to the UK is not the way that I would travel to Nigeria now. One suitcase, one small, and I was like, you know, eager to come back to the land that they gave birth to me. If I was to go to Nigeria now, they'd probably be repacking my suitcases at Heathrow Airport because of the amount of things that I'll be taking back. We were all there. Don't you remember? Were you like this? Did you, I mean, most of you have a um, British passport. You can stay in this country. When you came to this country, is that how things were? Didn't you, some of us, you know, I started in Marks and Spencer. And I remember, I will never forget, I said, God, deliver me from Marks and Spencer. This one that they will come and they will bring four clothes, come out with one, wearing the outfit of another one. And then they'll say that, you know, you won't even notice that what they came in with the, in the changing room is different from what they, how many would I look at? And I'll be, I'll be at Marks and Spencer from early in the morning till the evening, standing, and then someone will be insulting me. Ah, I was like, God, deliver me from this retail job. I mean, how many of you worked in McDonald's, Burger King, Care? Ah, all of you, so all of you just... Because you're looking at me now. <laughs> you were <laughs> How many of you were bus conductors? You know, drivers? Where did Jesus find you? What pits were you in? Did he deliver you? Some of us, almost every week in hospital, one appointment after the an another, having a stigma, just like Pastor was saying last week, Wednesday, I mean Sunday, when he shared about strength and weaknesses, some of us were labeled that when they see us, they don't know our name, but it's that label that they know. Do you remember? Did he deliver you? Set you free from something that you are constantly labeled at, like Naaman, when Pastor was talking about Naaman, but Naaman turned his, his weakness into a strength. He focused on his strength. Remember during the time of Joseph, Israel was favored as they had someone in authority. You know, during the time of Joseph, the Israelites were recognized because they had someone in government. That before the Pharaoh makes a decision, he will consult with Joseph. But see how quickly the tables turned. 
When that king died, what happened? They didn't remember about the children of Israel. And we will see who is Lord. And how quickly we can forget. Exodus 1.11. Exodus 1.11. Things changed when there was a new king. Therefore, the, um, the King James Version says, Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pathon and Ramesses. Amen. Exodus 2, 23 to 24. And after a while, the Israelites cried out for deliverance. And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried. And their cry came unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Number one, when you read the book of Exodus from chapters 1 to 14, at the first opportunity, the Israelites started to complain. They forgot. They forgot. Open Exodus 14, 11. Have you forgotten? Who is your Lord? Exodus 14, 11. At the first opportunity, they forgot. Huh? And they said unto Moses, eh, because there were no graves in Egypt, has thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore has thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Egypt that they were crying for God to deliver them. God now delivered them. And they are moving to the promised land and they forgot. How many of us have forgotten what God has done in our lives. When, when I was in university, I was still sharing it with my husband. My very first car was given to me, a Vauxhall Corsa. When you see my Vauxhall Corsa, even if you were a robber, my cousin said to me one day, no one will steal this car. They will actually put something inside the car for you. That's how bad the car was. And I would take my Corsa, no heating, I'll wrap myself, I'll be going to university, Brunel University. Look at where God has brought you to today. Who is your Lord? Have you forgotten? Remember. We talked about God, remember me. Now it is time for us to remember God. When you came into this country, was it student visa? Are you still a student? Someone said worse. <laughs> Are you still a student? When you came into this country, did you have a house to live in? Are you not now a homeowner? Or homes? Owner of ho houses? Not one, not two. If you were to get a phone call from Nigeria today, do you not have enough money to buy a ticket to go? Or do you need to borrow money? Ah, please, can I, can you give me 500? I need to quickly go to, eh? Is that still your story? Let us not forget. The second point, hunger was their owner. You see that in Exodus 16.3. I want us, who is your Lord? That's the question. The same Israelites, and we are like them, let us be honest, because our memory is like we have amnesia. God, oh, do this for me, do this for me, do this. We will now come, give testimony, glory to God. Then you now complain, oh, you didn't do the last one that I asked for. Exodus 16, 3. And the children of Israel said unto them, would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full. For you have now brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this holy assembly with hunger. Eh? What is it that they were eating in Egypt? They forgot. Brethren, what's it? You know, sometimes when it comes to food, I sometimes just watch. Because I, I think to myself that, you know, sometimes you go to parties and you see someone come out with plastic bowls in their car. And you'll be like, <laughs> you'll be like, sorry, are we not in the UK? 
is things that bad that you need to, and I think, I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's poverty mentality, but what am I saying? Things that should, used to be shameful. You used to have to, okay, let me not say you. My staple food was jollof rice. No meat, just get egg, boil the egg, and that is it. Regular. Because I know that with one plum tomato and some rodo, I'm done. Uh, am I lying? I don't need much. Drop of oil, rodo, one plum, I'm good. When I go to Iceland back then, or quick save as they used to call it, if I use less than five pounds to buy a carton of plum tomato, I have rice, I've got egg, I'm sorted. When I come to church, you don't know what I've eaten. Who cares? So long as I'm alive and well. Hunger. God will not allow hunger to make us forget where God has brought us from. Amen. Now, if the children say, Mommy, I want McDonald's. Mommy, I want Subway. Or if I say, okay, I want to go and eat in a restaurant that is classy. I don't have to think twice. But I know where I came from. I will never forget the day. When still, uh -huh. when, I, when I first of all started here, um, I was working in the church office. Amen. And because they, the money of the church was plenty in Jesus' name, I had to go on benefits. From that benefit, I will pay my tithe. And whatever is, and I remember, I'll never forget, I used to tell pastor, I said, 50p from Maiderville, I'll be praying that the inspector will not catch me on the bus. Because I'll say to God, God, you know where I'm going. I'm coming to your house. 50p, for, if they should catch me, is more than 50p. But by God, God knowing my heart, that it was just to serve him. I, when I get down at Sudbury, I'll just get down quickly. And I'm going to church. <laughs> but do you remember? What's your own story? I'm sharing my own because that's the only one that I can share. But I look and I remember. Thank God I don't have to knock on my neighbor's door to say, please, can you give me salt? Can you give me sugar? My children have not eaten today. Do you remember? Thirst. Exodus 17, 3. Are you still with me? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? That was their owner. Egypt that they were crying unto God for over how many years? That God deliver us from this bondage. Look at where we have come from. Look at the favor that has gone. And now you have the audacity that God has delivered you. And it is now thirst. That you're saying, eh, you brought us out of Egypt to kill us with thirst. Praise the Lord. Other gods. Exodus 32. Verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. It doesn't take us long. Before we start serving other gods. What are the other gods? Anything that is taking more time than God. Whether it's your spouse, your children, anything that, you know, it, it, that if God is not coming first, then what are we talking about? It's, a, it's another God. And you'd be surprised at how, you know, um, I was saying, I was sharing my, my daughter. I said, on my phone. I, by 10 o'clock, my phone just dims out. That is for me to say, is it enough? You've been on online enough. 10 o'clock, start getting ready to go to bed and, or do something else. 
Why? Because you notice that these things steal your time. Before you know it, from Netflix to Disney, from Disney to BBC iPlayer, from BBC iPlayer to whatever, what's next? From one program to another. Or if you're like TikTok or it's Instagram, I'm not saying don't do all these things, but if they're taking too much of your time, then be mindful of it. And it's so easy. Okay, what is another God? You say your job. Please tell me. Who gave you that job? I, I know I'm just checking. Were you qualified? You know, you yourself, you know that you are not qualified. Eh? You know. Because even when you came out of that interview and you said, ah, I got the job, oh, ah, but I didn't know what I said, though, because it was making nonsense to me. As far, as far as I'm concerned, I was saying nonsense. But they seem to have liked me. I do not know why. And you know you're not qualified. Out of the 10 skills, you only have two or three. And yet, who do you think gave you that job? Who is your Lord? Band one, two, seven, five, four. Who is it that has done it for you, my sister? Is it that you're qualified? We know that there are people. We know we have managers who are more qualified than us. We know that we have people in our places of work that are more qualified. Why is God blessing us like this? Because we don't deserve it. Who is your Lord? When other people are losing jobs, you still have yours. Please, somebody help me thank God. Even if you have lost your job, God has restored it. If you continue reading Hosea 2, God identifies the things that keep pulling Israel away from him. I'm not going to go into it. So that was Israel. Israel that God delivered from Egypt and they forgot. Now let's look at the next person. I want you to point to your neighbor and look at all the other three fingers that are pointing. Which direction are they pointing to? So, no, uh, wait now. Point to your neighbor. Yeah, point. And the other fingers, where are they pointing to? Uh, so, we're looking at you now. <laughs> James 1, 23 to 24. James 1, 23 to 24. <laughs> For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way. And straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Today, we will look at ourselves. The Bible records in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave. He came down for you, for me, and everyone here. Is Jesus really Lord in every single area of your life? Let's go. Is he Lord? In your relationship with him. How much time do you spend in his word? How much time do you spend worshipping him? I, there's a, a, a drama that someone explained to myself and my husband. And since that person explained that drama, I've not been able to get over it. Is Jesus Lord in your relationship with your spouse, with your husband, with your wife, your fiancé, or whoever it is? Is he Lord in your relationship with your children? Is he Lord in your relationship with your own parents? Yes, parents. Uh-huh. We're saying it like it is. Is Jesus Lord? Hello, my corner. <laughs> is he Lord in your relationship with your parents? Yes, we do accept. We might, we're not qualified. We, don't, we probably didn't get first class in the degree for parents. But at least we are there. Are we, are we not there? At least we come back home every day. You have clothes on your back. You have the latest, if not the greatest, but at least you have the latest phone or something of sorts. And we support you. Yes, my corner, I'm looking at you. Uh -huh. <laughs> all of the people in my corner, I know there's one over there, but you know, we know ourselves, you know, because it's easy to criticize someone when you haven't got the job description. Don't worry, by the, by the grace of God, like our, like our own parents told us, 
your own time too is coming. <laughs> and as our own parents said, we, they did, they, uh, what, how would they say, you won't kill me, or I won't kill you. What, what's the word that they say? <laughs> eh? I didn't kill my parents. So <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Is he Lord in your health? Is he Lord in your career? In your career, can it be said that you are excellent at what you do? In your career, are you the first person to get there and the last person to leave? Or is your uh, seven hours, seven hours, or is it that you spend most of the seven hours doing other things and then maybe use it one hour and two or two hours to actually do the work because you're his example you're the light that shines out in the world he's not you know you are his representative in your place of work are you excellent at what you do can they say can they vouch for you that no when this person is on site we, we know that everything is sorted is he lord in your career it's not for you to just to have a job and take the money but he needs you to be the light in that place. Praise the Lord. Someone said to me, someone said to me that when you come to church on Sunday, what you learn in church on Sunday is supposed to take you throughout the whole of the following week to help you to, uh, you know, to minister to the people because your place of work is your church. You don't need to look for this congregation. They come. They come to you. Your manager your colleagues, your team members, you know. And what, how do I, literally two things make a difference. Which, you know, in the days when we used to go to the office, you don't just make tea for yourself. Oh. You make tea for the rest of your, even if you don't like tea. What does it say to them? You are a member of the team. But when you're not, ah, no, I, do, I can't come. I can't make, I don't like tea. Ah, hey, no, you, you, do, you hey. you're the light in that place that is dark. When others are gossiping around, you don't take part in the gossip. And they will know you for that. Praise the Lord. Is he, like, is he Lord in your career? Is he also the Lord in your business? You know, business people, God will bless you. And God will, you know, enable you to um, provide quality service. And also... Excellence, because when you're diligent in everything that you do, God will bring you before kings and not mean men. That's what the, it's not me. That's what the Bible says. So when you're diligent in your business, he will open doors unexpectedly. And that is only when you make him Lord over your business. Your finances. Let's not even go there. As I said, I started off when I was on benefits. And I thought, I think it would be easier for me when I start with the little that I have, so that when the big comes, it will be like nothing. Amen? I'm a living testimony of God's faithfulness. You know, if you knew me before, it was plenty of, you know, let us not go down that road. But God is faithful. And when he sees your heart, he makes a way. Where I am now is God. <laughs> I've shared the testimony before. When I applied for the job, they asked me, how did you know about this? Because we haven't advertised it yet. I said, well, I saw an advert somewhere and I applied. So before they knew it, I immediately I saw it. I applied there and then. And the guy called me and said, sorry, no. How do you know about this job? Because we haven't advertised it. Well, <laughs> that's the favor of God. That's God. They hadn't advertised. They, they, they didn't understand how I got to know about the job because they hadn't advertised it. And when they interviewed me, they said, you know, um, can you hold on for a minute? We don't want to let you go. There's someone else. When they were now ready for me, I just continued doing my work. They now said, so where do you want us to interview? I said, well, I'm not coming to Liverpool unless you are paying my, my train ticket. So they said, okay, we will send her down. Like, okay, so she has to come and meet me in Fleet Street, Starbucks, near St. Paul's. They sent someone from Manchester 
the person who would end up being my manager, they sent her. When she was on the train going back to Manchester, they had already given me the offer letter. When she was still talking to me, she was saying to me, I still need to interview someone else that I haven't made my decision. Before she landed in Manchester, the job offer was already in my, in my email. That is God. When you make him the Lord over your finances, unexpected, undeserved. Do I qualify? I'm not qualified, and I know it, but I know who qualifies the qualifier. <laughs> Amen. Is he Lord in your community? Around you, do you take notice of what's going on? Do you pray for those in your estate? Do you pray for those around you? Recently, we had a neighbor of ours whose husband passed away, and she came knocking on her. Did she come knocking on her? No, we got a phone call from so someone that was in Jersey. We that were next door, we didn't know. The person that was in Jersey is the one that called one of our neighbors. And that's how we got to know. But they knew that they could still call upon us. Can they call upon you? Is your testimony enough that someone that is in need can knock on your door and say, I need help? Have you really made Jesus Christ Lord in your community? Do you pray for those on your street, for those in your estate? Or is it that you think that, every, that as long as I'm saved, that's it. Me and my family were sorted. It doesn't work like that too. Praise the Lord. Is he the owner of everything in your life? If he is, then that means you can't treat your body anyhow, eat anything. We've talked about that. Imagine a life without worrying. Knowing Jesus Christ has got everything in control. If by listening to his word today, you realize you haven't made him Lord of all, I want you to repent and cry out and invite him in. If this is your first time accepting this invitation, just tell him you want him to be the Lord of your life. Let him take the driver's seat of your life and let him be your pilot. Praise the Lord. Brethren, who is your Lord? Is there areas in your life? Is it your finances? Has it got to do with your family? What is it that you still need to make him Lord? We're going to take some time. And we're going to pray. But before we pray, you see, all of this is about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And I'm going to read Matthew 6 from verse 24. And we'll round up. It says, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold on to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet their heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much more than they? And I'm going to read verse 33. And this is where we round up. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Brethren, this is an opportunity where you have identified in your life areas that he's not yet Lord. I want you to use this opportunity in the next few minutes to invite him to say, Jesus Come and take control over these areas in my life. Jesus, have mercy on me. Whether it's in your health, in your relationship, even with your family, we can't do this by ourselves. It has to be God. And if you are someone that is here, that you have no idea what we're talking about, that you want to take part and let Jesus and invite him in and say, Lord, come and be Lord in my life. I surrender. He's here. The things that I cannot do, he can do. There are things, there are places that you cannot go, that he will go. There are places in life whereby they're talking about you, and yet there's someone there defending you because Jesus is Lord. I want you to, if, you're, if, you know, if this is your first time of, of accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, just say, Lord, come and be the Savior of my life. I repent, I I'm a sinner, I have sinned, but I need you in my life. I can't do this by myself. 
I can't fulfill purpose. I can't fulfill my destiny without you, Lord Jesus. Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. Lord, as your children, we repent and we come back to you saying, Lord, we are definitely hungry for your kingdom, oh God. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done. Take all the glory. Take all the honor. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Brother Noah, can you please come to the round? Praise the Lord. Uh, may we please uh, rise up even as we close. And we'll start by pointing our hands towards the minister of his word, Pastor Abby, who has shared an important word of re-examination. Let's ask God that the Lord will be our God in all areas, that the Lord will answer her as she calls, and as she has shared this word of truth with us today, the Lord shall be true in all circumstances and situation of our life in the name of Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word of truth, your word of life that has come forth. As we receive this word today, O oh Lord, let it transform us. Let it bring about change even in our lives in the name of Jesus. Amen. That we will put you first in all things. We will not count. Plain, we will not murmur, but I will turn to you, even in all things, because the last Bible passage, Matthew 6, 33, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. We are here today to seek you, as we have come to seek you, Lord. Let us find you, even in all situations, in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we say thank you. We thank you for all you've done for us, even since the beginning of this service today from the workers' service to the praise and worship to the announcement to the offering and tithes giving. Lord, we ask, oh Lord, that you will accept us, accept our service of today, and accept all our giving in the name of Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, we want to also lift up our parents in the Lord. Oh Lord, who are on mission field, who are traveling. Lord, we ask, oh Lord, that your hand of protection and your anointing upon them will not fail in the name of Jesus. Amen. And as we go in the week, O oh Lord, Father, go with us. Amen. In all things that we will do, O oh Lord, be the Lord in our lives. Amen. Be the Lord in our lives, in our going out, in our coming in. Over our homes, over our finances, Amen. over our career, over our health, Amen. over our work, even over our studies for our young ones, O oh Lord, who are going out daily, be a wall of protection over them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Build your wall of protection over us too in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we say thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Let's put our hands together for the Lord. Let's appreciate God.